And now we'll talk about uh, currency and circulation in Nigeria, the implication for the economy and yes, the value of the Naira that you are holding. Uh, a couple of days ago, we did see that number, that M3, that's the money supply, uh, was close to hitting 100 trillion Naira as at May 2024. You stood at 99.23 trillion Naira. Uh, that's really close. And this is in spite of the, a lot of efforts. We see uh, a lot of activities, federal government activities in the fixed income market, all in the bid to mop up this liquidity from circulation. I wonder what's going on with that. But let's talk to the Chief Executive Officer of the CFG Advisory, Mr. Tilewa Wadibajo, joins us virtually from Lagos. Mr. Adebajo, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much. So this issue of uh, currency in circulation, I thought by now, with the aggressive mopping up that the government is doing, especially using the securities, uh, we, we would not be near this number. Are we missing out something? Um, yes, indeed. It's quite uh, puzzling and um, at the same time it's worrisome uh, in the sense that um, we've been trying hard to reduce inflation and you wonder if why that is the reason why inflation is not abating uh, as fast as it should be considering the fact that we've seen significant hikes, uh, we've seen the CRR go up and uh, a major tightening policy by the central bank. But having said that, we see that between last year and this year, money supply went up by about 87% uh, from about 50 trillion to about 90 trillion. Uh, and from January, we've seen an increase of about 9 trillion uh, to date now, uh, which is what is worrisome, and we're heading close to 100 trillion. Um, so we need to understand that. We can understand that I think about 30 trillion uh, came in from the ways and means financing that was finally recognized. Uh, but in terms of the rest of the increases, uh, we'll have to take more of an in-depth look to find out uh, exactly what the challenges are. But exactly, um, you know, this is like, you know, it's going to be tight because if you continue to increase money supply, um, you find out that the rate of inflation uh, it's going to take much longer for a week to see some relief. Okay, so um, obviously with inflation increasing, by now we know the impact. Individuals, we know higher prices, what it does. Uh, of course, purchasing power is hammered down and, and uh, you know, the impact it has on our, on our everyday life. But is there, you think, a way that this can be curbed? Um, do we need to add more of the policy? I mean, we're already complaining of interest rates and CRR and, and, and all of that. Is there something that can be added to deal with this? Yes, indeed. Um, first of all, I think it's also important to understand that it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I do not think we're going to see any significant reduction in inflation numbers until about this time next year. So I think we need to bear that in mind. Uh, the, uh, the green shoots that we're seeing is the fact that month on month inflation as a whole is declining. And if we take a look at core inflation, whilst if you remove food prices and energy prices, we're seeing more of a significant reduction on that. So we know clearly that what is driving inflation is uh, food inflation and energy prices. Uh, that is very clear. So that needs to be done. So what else needs to be done is the fact that the government also has to reduce its expenditure. Uh, government needs to embark on cutting expenditure and a lot of all the frivolous spending needs to stop. Um, and government needs to lead by example with its austerity measures so that everybody can take this measure seriously. Because in terms of trying to control inflation, what is important is that we need to be steadfast and we understand the issues. There's some structural reforms that also need to be done. Uh, we also know that food inflation is linked to banditry and terrorism in the northern parts of the country. A lot of our farmers that are otherwise should be productive are either in um, IDP camps or have moved into the urban areas. And this, of course, is affect our productivity, especially in the agri-sector, which is the largest contributor to Nigeria's GDP. 
Mm, so you, you talk about government uh, uh, costs, cost of governance, and obviously we've been talking about this, and the issue of leakages, uh, perhaps being the weak side of this policy reform, which, may, which seems to be why we're not getting the expected impact. But, but uh, <laughs> cutting cost of governance seems to be a very long one. We see appointments every day. We did hear of the merging of ministries and departments. We haven't seen that. Perhaps I've missed that, but I haven't seen anything like that. So when we talk about cutting cost of governance, where exactly do you think this can start from? Well, we need to take a look at our debt levels. Our debt levels are becoming rather unsustainable as we see it. The highest line of the budget this year is debt repayment and servicing, which is about eight trillion. Now, the next line on the budget is defense, which is about two and something trillion. Now, if your debt, if the def if your debt servicing and debt repayment is four times your defense budget then there's a big problem. To add to that, I think even if you take a look at this year, these issues with the four budgets running concurrently is also a source for concern because it shows that there's a problem. Because if you take a look at the 2024 budget, we thought that was already running until recently when we were told that they're going to extend the 2023 budget. So that, for me, is a red flag because it is totally unconventional. Now, we have a challenge from the 2024 budget where we projected a deficit of 9.1 trillion. Now, by half year, we had a revenue shortfall of 3.8 trillion. So we are now proposing a supplementary budget of 6.6 .6 trillion. So the total for that is 19.5 trillion. So we have about another 20 trillion that we have not accounted for that we are budgeting for, that we now need to finance. So the shortfall or the budget deficit for the 2024 budget is now close to 20 trillion from the original plan of nine. So that is an increase of about 10.5 trillion. So for me, that is really where the concern is. So it is important that we reconcile and we consolidate all these budgets so that we understand the true position uh, because the run rate for borrowing, according to the debt management office, is that they're borrowing, the government is borrowing about seven trillion a month, uh, every quarter. So if you do take a look at the same run rate, you're looking at close to 30 trillion of borrowing this year alone. Now, if eight trillion is what you're using to service your debts and pay back a year and interest rates are going up, these numbers are going to go beyond eight trillion. So there is a significant challenge now because, you know, debt payment has become the highest line in the budget. And, you know, it's not sustainable that your defense budget is, you know, your debt uh, repayments and debt servicing is four times that of your defense budget. Not to talk about healthcare, agriculture, education and social services. So we really need to go back to the drawing board and we look at government finances and how government is spending money. Because it, right now, this concurrent budget is a major red flag. Yeah, Mr. Dibajo, and, and I'm glad you brought up that issue of the concurrent budget because uh, just before we came on air, we're discussing it in the office and, and wondering, I mean, if for, even for private companies, you do close a book, close a budget, for the year, and then you start another one, even if you were to carry over some projects, you know, up to the next budget or the next budget year. So what's the implication of this concurrent? Uh, uh, we have the 2024, we have the supplementary, and then we have the 2023 now extended. I mean, what are the complications? Really, why do we even have to do that? Why can't we be done with one and move to the next? Well, that's why I said it's totally unconventional. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know the reason why that has been done, but it's unconventional. As you said, you clo it's, it wasn't until about two weeks ago I found out that we were not running the 2024 budget. Um, so um, we need to consolidate these budgets because if you're doing that, first of all, you don't, we don't have the funding for all those, all those three budgets, all those four budgets. The funding is not in place. 
And right now we are in a deficit position on even on the 2024 budget, like I've said, the funding deficit is now 19.5 trillion. Uh, so there is, I don't know where we're going to get the money to fund that budget. And when you talk about trying to tame inflation, um, you know, we need to be very careful. So um, I think uh, the Minister of Budget and Planning needs to make a statement on this. Uh, the National Assembly needs to explain better to us why this is the case. And um, we need to see some sort of accountability and transparency uh, because the signals are not very good. And the IMF and the World Bank are not going to uh, smile kindly on this. And um, at the end of the day, all the loans that we're expecting from them, if they find out that we're not getting it right on the fiscal side with our fiscal reforms or fiscal responsibility, then there's going to be a problem. And I think we should also know the fact that I've been talking about remedial legislation. It's overdue. We are violating the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and we are also violating Section 38 of the CBN Act in terms of the securitization of the Ways and Means financing. Remedial legislation is needed now to be able to resolve the fiscal challenges that Nigeria is currently undergoing. So what happens if nothing is done? I mean, if we have this uh, concurrent uh, budget running, uh, we have the continuous increase in, in debt servicing, and then, of course, we have uh, money circulation also uh, continuing to increase. W what harm or what can be the impact on the economy and especially our purchasing power? Well, you, with the challenge, like you said, is to reduce inflation. So if you continue to put money into into system, then you're going to the, uh, the aim of getting to 21 percent interest rates by year end is going to be under a lot of challenge. Um, the impact is the fact that there is a limit to which you can borrow. So eventually we're going to get to that limit. Uh, I think we've already exceeded that limit. Um, so and I think that is really what we need to start to address. Um, so that we can now begin to go back to the drawing board. But even though you're running four budgets, you can't fund all budgets. So somebody has to make a decision as to what the priority is with the funds available and what they're going to do. So the worst thing that will happen is the fact that you don't have money. And then when you have money, you now decide which one of the projects you are going to fund in the budget. But without a doubt, the recurrent expenditure will have to continue. Uh, so where you'll find that the challenge will be on the capital expenditure with projects. Uh, and that will be on a first-come, first-served basis. And then somebody will now have to sit down and be the decider on what projects get funded and what projects does not get funded. Uh, so at the end of 2024, then maybe we'll start implementing the 2024. At the end of 2024, we'll conclude 2023 budget. And then 2025, we'll start implementing 2024 budget. But, you know, we do not want to get into this uh, cycle. It's not conventional. Yeah, it does sound uh, complicated right there. But thank you so much for your time. Uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the CFG Advisory, Mr. Tiliwadi Bajo, thank you.